Thousands of people have been infected with AIDS through blood transfusions, and they're not aware of it. When blood kills, it's should we have For the known. first time, the untold story of AIDS Were in our blood bank. mistakes made that will haunt us. Tom Jarrell reports, when blood kills, should we have known? Right after this. Tonight, the first in a series of 2020 reports on the safety of America's blood supply. And we begin with the biggest concern to all of us. That is the spread of AIDS through blood transfusions. And we want to stress that because it's now possible to screen donors infected with AIDS, the risk of getting AIDS through a blood transfusion now is extremely small. But... But what we've uncovered is that before the screening programs were put in place, thousands of Americans received blood contaminated with AIDS. And worse, most of those infected don't know it and now may be infecting others. In the first of this of several reports, Tom Jarrell tells how for years AIDS was spreading through the blood supply and how we missed opportunities to stop it. Blood. We take it for granted until we need it. Ten pints of it flow through our bodies. After an accident, serious surgery, or for cancer therapy, blood transfusion can save our lives. Blood can be donated directly at hospitals. Blood can also be donated to community blood centers or the Red Cross, which then distributes it to hospitals. Blood is split into different components, which are then transfused back into the needy patient. Red cells carry oxygen to the brain. Platelets help the blood to clot, and plasma provides protein and volume. Each component can be given to a different patient and each component can carry disease. A number of, Regrettable. Uh, I, I guess, responsible agents around the country are saying that the blood supply is safe. And the fact is that the blood supply has never been safe. By far the safe. most direct, effective way of discovering contaminated blood is through testing the product itself before it's used. Only since March of 1985 has there been a screening test for AIDS, the public's biggest concern with the blood supply. That test identifies antibodies in the blood. This is how it works. When the body is attacked by a virus, the immune system makes antibodies, which can kill or neutralize that virus. These antibodies often remain in our system to ward off further attacks by the same virus. That's why we don't get diseases like chickenpox again. But in the case of the AIDS virus, the antibodies usually don't work. We aren't sure why, but one theory is the AIDS virus changes so fast that by the time the antibodies are produced, the virus has changed its shape, making the antibodies ineffective against it. But those antibodies serve another purpose. They act as signals to the screening test that the virus exists. In short, if there are antibodies present, it's a good indication the person has been infected with the AIDS virus. No test is perfect, but one more problem in AIDS screening is that if someone is infected with the virus on, say, New Year's Eve, they may not develop antibodies for several weeks. During that period, an infected person could donate blood and his illness would not show up. Could that happen today? Yes, it could. We may be talking of risks for AIDS in one in a hundred thousand, but it is still possible for AIDS to be transmitted by blood as well as other diseases. And I think it's, uh, it's a shame that the public is being told in some cases that the blood supply is safe because it's just not true. Blood is a very dangerous drug that should be used only when life-threatening circumstances are present. Since AIDS began to spread in 1979, an estimated 26 million Americans have received blood transfusions. The most well-known, of course, is President Reagan, who received eight transfusions after the assassination attempt in 1981. Most of these transfusions go without mishap, but with an incubation period that can be more than five years, an estimated 12,000 people alive today could have been transfused with the AIDS virus without knowing it. Over 500 already have AIDS. I got AIDS through a blood transfusion. That's what happened to Amy Sloan, a young mother from Lafayette, Indiana. We introduced our audience to Amy and her family more than a year ago. I received the blood in October of 1982, and I didn't become ill until May of 1984. And so I carried this virus around for a year and a half, having no idea in the world that I was ill. So there are a lot of people that are walking around carrying this virus that who knows how many people they're transmitting it to. To find people like Amy, the Red Cross and other blood suppliers have instituted a program called Look Back. This is how it works. 
Each time a donor gives, his blood is typed and tested for diseases, including AIDS. Should it prove positive for AIDS, the donor center looks back at the donor's prior history to see who had received his blood. Earlier recipients are then contacted through their physicians and asked to come in and be tested. If you're one of the 26 million Americans who has received a blood transfusion since 1979, you could be notified through the Look Back program. That's what happened to Shirley. I remember I stepped out of the elevator and he said, sit down. And I did, and he started to tell me that back in 1983, I received uh, a transfusion and uh, that I had, I, along with other patients at the unit, receive uh, this bad blood. And I, I just began to cry. Shirley's husband has left her. She has two young children, and she's now showing early signs of the disease. Who do you blame? What I do could think be done the doctor should have uh, actually found out more, you know. You don't just tell people, oh, the blood is okay, you know, go ahead. It's nothing wrong with it, you know. And then later on, Shirley has begun happens. legal action against the blood bank which provided the blood. She has been encouraged by the first transfusion AIDS case to come to trial in the United States, that of Francis Borchelt. Bad blood killed Francis Borchelt. She hadn't even known she was getting blood. She received three units during an elective hip surgery in August of 1983. She had wanted to dance at her son's wedding. Two years later, she died of AIDS. Were you told as a family about any of the risk of the blood transfusions? No. This was in 1983, and I think there was the beginning of some information being passed around that AIDS might be caught through a blood transfusion. And it, it wasn't that it concerned us at all. Bob Borschelt and daughter Kathy had no reason to be concerned. They, like the rest of the country, had been led to believe the blood supply was perfectly safe. However, our 2020 investigation has found that AIDS was probably in the nation's blood supply by the late 1970s. Doctors first recognized the problem in 1982. Yet the blood industry played down the dangers. A specific An test for AIDS was marketed in 1985, three years later. During that period, infected blood inadequately screened continued to pump into the system. How did it Do you feel the public was misled about the safety of the blood supply? They were being told that it was not a problem, when in fact it, it was most a problem. people knew that it was a problem at that time. Dr. Arthur Amon, a pediatric immunologist, discovered the first case of transfusion AIDS in an infant here in San Francisco. Where did it come from? Well, the only risk factor we could find in talking to the parents uh, and going over the medical history were blood transfusions. Were you able to find the specific one that carried the suspected virus? Well, that was the key. One of the donors had been registered as an AIDS patient. Amon wasn't surprised. He and his colleagues had reason to suspect AIDS could be spread by transfusion. Within medicine, they already knew what we, the public at large, didn't know. As early as July 1982, the first warning that AIDS might be spread through blood products appeared here in the Centers for Disease Control Bulletin with a report of hemophiliacs who had been receiving blood products. By December, there were more hemophiliac cases reported, and Amon's infant. And it really didn't take a whole lot of logic to put together what was happening in hemophilia patients, knowing that they had been getting blood products and they were developing AIDS, to say that eventually there had to be someone to develop AIDS. And I think this case was the alarming one. Irwin Memorial Blood Bank of San Francisco provided the blood. Dr. Herbert Perkins is medical director. Within a few weeks, there was a meeting held by the Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, to discuss what ought to be done. The meeting was a bit of a disaster with no consensus. January 4th, 1983, blood suppliers from all over the country came to address the problem. It was an emotionally charged meeting. One CDC expert pounded the table and pleaded, die before something is done. Dr. Lou Barker was there. At that time, he was in charge of blood services for the American Red Cross. They supply more than half the nation's blood. In terms of alerting people, if there's a tainted bottle of Tylenol on the shelf, the entire product may be recalled, the shelves are emptied. There was no alarm like that from the Red Cross when this baby was uh, shown to have come down with AIDS from well, transfusion. One thing blood. we couldn't do, and this is very important for you to understand, is we couldn't take all the blood off the shelf. There's just no way you can do that with the blood supply and be responsible to people who require blood transfusions. 
But 2020 has learned there was more that could have been done. At that meeting, CDC investigators had presented ways to screen the blood for high-risk donors. The most promising test was called the core antibody test. Since the highest risk groups for AIDS also had high rates of hepatitis, the CDC doctors showed that by the use of a special hepatitis test called the core antibody test, they could screen out most of the AIDS-infected contributors. The blood providers were Besides not the They had two other concerns, supply People and cost. People will die if blood is not available. So we were not going to be rushed quickly into adopting a test which might turn out to be totally useless uh, and in the process risking the availability of blood for people who might die. Aaron Kellner from the New York Blood Center said such testing would cost his organization $5 million a year. The Red Cross had there reservations too. There was no clear light in the tunnel with regard to what we could do beyond stopping people from donating who were at risk of developing AIDS. Less than two weeks following that meeting, the blood bankers released a joint statement cautioning against using blood from groups at high risk for AIDS, gay males, Haitians, and IV drug users. That same statement minimized the risk to the blood supply, saying the evidence for blood transmission of AIDS was unproven, incomplete, and inconclusive. I think the way you, you gain confidence is, is not by denying a problem, especially when you're dealing with a, with a health problem. You've got to gain the confidence of the scientific community and the public by saying, uh, it may not be a problem, but because the safety of the blood product is important to you and to us, we will go ahead and institute the following procedures. And that wasn't the response. Not only did they decline to adopt a surrogate test, like the core antibody test to screen blood, they also advised against anyone else using such a test. Once you've seen these patients uh, with your own eyes, I think it becomes a much more convincing matter. Unlike the Red Cross, Dr. Edgar Engelman, director of the blood bank at Stanford's University Hospital, was convinced they must start some sort of indirect screening immediately. His laboratory was already studying the immune system and had a machine to test the blood's T cells, which helped to provide us with immunity. Abnormal T cells were already an indication of AIDS. When we contacted individuals who uh, had abnormal uh, T cell tests, some of them, many of them, in fact, turned out to be members of high-risk groups who should not have been donating blood in the first place, but simply didn't realize or denied, if you will, that they were uh, at risk. We felt then that uh, voluntary deferral would, would be useful, Defying but not Defying pressure from the nation's blood bankers, Engelman started testing his donors in April 1983. The first blood bank to screen the actual product, blood for AIDS rather than asking donors a few questions to screen themselves. The other blood bankers did not follow suit, even as the months passed and the cases mounted. These minutes from the Blood Products Advisory Committee to the FDA show constant debate over testing and a reluctance to act. Dr. Joseph Bovey was chairman of that committee. It seemed that we could have done the blood supply a service by implementing anti-core testing at that time. It seemed also that we could have helped out a lot of people with their anxiety. I think big organizations move slowly. The government moves slowly. By May of 1984, Irwin Memorial did adopt the core antibody test, the same test the CDC had presented to the blood bankers more than a year earlier. The Red Cross and most other blood banks still refused to screen blood until the AIDS antibody test was marketed in March of 1985 over two years after the first confirmed case of AIDS in the blood supply was discovered. By that time, an estimated 24,000 people had received AIDS-contaminated blood. Though half have died from their original illnesses, an estimated 12,000 are alive today. I don't think they wanted to alarm people, and so it was an attitude of let's wait, wait and see. And in, in a sense, the experiment that was being done was to uh, let time take its course, and if it got to be a worse problem, then we'll react. If you're wrong, the person, of course, who suffers the most is, is the bl blood product recipient. It was the most horrible death that I've ever seen. She was uh, twisting and all over the bed, um, shaking. She kept asking me why she was sick. Had any of the indirect or surrogate test for AIDS been in place at the time of her surgery, Frances Borchelt might have been alive today. The Borchelt's case is the first transfusion aid suit to come to trial. 
Irwin agreed to a settlement admitting only to administrative error, yet they do have second thoughts about their decision making. Given the knowledge that we have today, would have implemented core antibody testing on December the, the 1st or, or of 1982. The Red Cross, on the other hand, insists that asking donors at high risk for AIDS to refrain from donating was the only thing In the to do. In the spring of 83, the blood bank at Stanford University Hospital had set up a surrogate screening for AIDS. In the spring of 84, San Francisco's community blood bank uh, had set up a surrogate screening system. Why didn't the Red Cross well, take Tom, those steps? There was no evidence of any test that would be useful prior to the availability of a specific test. Dr. Dennis Donahue disagrees. He was head of the FDA's Division of Blood and Blood Products from 1980 to 86. That division regulates the blood industry. I thought the evidence was good that there was a correlation between anti-core positive test results and those people that had been defined as being at risk of transmitting AIDS. Why couldn't you insist on that being used? We discussed this in well, an advisory committee meeting. My personal conviction was that it should be done. The committee that addressed it again said no. I thought the committee was heavily weighted because there was no one on it who wasn't either industry or uh, someone closely allied to industry. That sounds almost uh, clubbish. I think it is clubbish, and I think it at times is too clubbish. We asked the FDA about these matters, but they declined our request Dr. for an Donahue interview. told us the FDA tends to recommend rather than to regulate, even to the extent of not requiring blood collectors to test for AIDS. Now, at least to my knowledge, there's never been a regulation published that says that blood has to be tested for the HTLV-3 virus by the licensed test. The AIDS virus? Yes. How can that be? I don't know who's responsible for it but somebody ought to put their finger on A it. A regulation to, to require AIDS testing was proposed this past February. As of yet, no action has been taken, even though it's been almost two years since the AIDS blood test has been available. That is amazing and frightening. It certainly is. Tom, will the Look Back program be able to find all the people who might have gotten contaminated uh, blood transfusions? Unfortunately not, Barbara. The Look Back program does not work if the donors have stopped giving. In other words, if a donor has died of AIDS, for example, or stopped donating blood, then a recipient would not be notified through Look Back. They would have to go in and be tested. Oh, so the only way to be sure is to be tested. But the screening test for AIDS has now left the blood supply safe. For AIDS, it's much safer. There are other diseases of the blood uh, which are very dangerous. Hepatitis, for example, infects more people a year, in a year than AIDS, and that'll be the subject of a future report. Uh -huh. And also, what happens if you have to have an operation, what you should do about blood. Mm -hmm. ah, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. I think one thing we ought to stress is that there is a great need for blood from healthy people. And the fear that you could get AIDS by donating blood is absolutely untrue and unfounded. You cannot get AIDS by giving blood. We'll be right back.